Thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, I'm here today at the James Julia Auction House, taking a look at some of the guns that they are going to be selling in their Spring of 2017 auction in April. One of the ones they have is this Canadian Experimental Lightened No. 4 Enfield rifle. Of course everyone always wants combat rifles to be lighter and handier, especially when you're carrying them around, and long, the Long Branch Arsenal decided to try its hand at making a lightened Lee Enfield. This kind of went side... this was taking place simultaneously with a number of other experiments, which would ultimately lead to the number 5 Mark I jungle carbine, as it's called, um, which was a shortened, lightened Lee Enfield rifle. But this Canadian version actually is not insignificantly lighter than the number 5. Now just a quick bit of background, uh, these were made at the Long Branch Arsenal, which was an arsenal set up in Canada specifically to address war production needs for World War II. Its first production guns went out the door in June of 41, and it would continue to produce various arm, small arms until 1945, the end of the war. This particular rifle was developed in 1943. They made a total of about three dozen of them, maybe 40. Um, the, the known serial numbers I believe range up to 32. Uh, this particular one is serial number 13. And these would be trialed by both the British in late 43 and also the US at Aberdeen Proving Grounds in March of 44. And apparently the trials went pretty well. Um, they seem to have done reasonably well. The, this rifle design would ultimately be rejected in favour of what became the number 5, but it's certainly an interesting thing to look at. Because what they did was pick and pull little bits of weight out of every conceivable spot on the rifle. The net result was the barrel, well the barrel was only about two and a half inches shorter than a standard rifle. Standard was 25.2 inch, this is 22.8. But they actually reduced the weight of the gun by a full quarter. So the original, the standard number four rifle is nine pound one ounce, that's four kilograms. This is six pounds nine ounces, which is three kilograms. So literally a quarter of the weight of the gun gone, and that's pretty substantial. In fact it was substantial enough that they fitted all of these rifles with rubber uh, recoil pads. Now the recoil pad on this one, as with most of them, has deteriorated fairly badly over the past 70 years. And in this case it's been taken off and replaced with a standard plastic butt plate. But when the military puts a rubber recoil pad on a rifle it really goes to tell you that you know, the recoil is probably going to be fairly harsh. Why don't we go ahead and take a closer look at this, and I'll show you a number of the different places where they took weight off the gun, and other little tricks and techniques. Starting at the muzzle here, you can see that the front sight has been redesigned. Uh, it is lightened. Even something like the length of the front sight protector wings, that creates weight. And so by making that uh, whole assembly a little bit smaller, they were able to shave just a little bit of weight off. Now the barrel is the same diameter as a standard number four. That was required because it has bayonet lugs for the standard number four uh, spike or blade bayonet, and they needed to retain that. So they didn't actually reduce the barrel diameter substantially. Looking at the back of the receiver, there are a couple of pretty significant changes that have been made. One of them is that the left side of the receiver has been substantially cut down. Uh, so this sidewall is shorter, this thumb groove is deeper and larger, and that was done to reduce, well obviously to reduce the amount of material. Now they made sure when they did this that they ended up with the same amount of structural material on both sides of the receiver. Uh, one of the alleged reasons for the number five jungle carbine having accuracy issues was not having the same amount of material on both sides of the receiver to support um, the barrel. So they, they've probably done a better job of fixing that. You'll notice there's a, a milled out section right here to relieve some weight. This is similar to what was done on the jungle carbine, the number five, but in a different way, different details there. And then substantially, a couple other significant issues. Normally an Enfield has a two-piece stock, and there's a socket at the back here where the rear butt stock attaches. That has been removed, and instead there's a screw that allows, well there's a hole that allows a screw to go through the bottom of the wrist of the stock up into the top of the receiver to fix the stock in place. So by getting rid of that socket they were able to remove a significant amount of weight. They also redesigned the trigger mechanism a bit so that the trigger is held on the receiver. On a typical number four Enfield, the sear is on the receiver but the trigger is actually mounted to the trigger guard. This caused some issues 
at various times. Things like change swelling of the wood of the stock could impact uh, the trigger pull or the reliability of the trigger mechanism. But that's not exactly why they made this change here. This is a good functional change for that reason, but this was also done so that the trigger guard could be reduced in weight, because it no longer had a structural purpose. It didn't have to support the trigger, it just had to literally guard the trigger and support the edges of the magazine. The rear sight on here is a standard uh, number 4 Mark I rifle rear sight. This was... had this rifle gone any further in trials, this would have been replaced by a stamped sheet metal sight, and they would have reduced weight even a little bit more. Um, as it stands, they just pulled a, an off-the-shelf part to use here. The range designations on it would not have been correct, because the barrel length is different, but for this level of testing that was not a, a significant issue. The trigger guard is reduced in complexity, because of course it no longer has to support the trigger itself, and it is now made out of an, an aluminum alloy. So this weighs like next to nothing, and definitely an area where there's no need to have a really strong structural steel component. Aluminum does the job just fine, and weighs a lot less. You can tell by the finish also that this is alloy. The stock, however, is one of the places where we see some of the most significant weight reduction. So for one thing, there's this big hollowed out cut on both sides of the buttstock. Um, this is... this doesn't quite make it as weak as actually cutting a hole through the middle of the stock, like, say, a much later Iraqi Tabuk rifle. Uh, but it does remove that much wood and weight. Um, the, the weight reduction in the stock is quite significant here. Now, this is a single one-piece stock, because the butt socket has been removed. So you can see the hole here, where the action sits up here, and is bolted to the trigger guard. Inside the stock, you'll notice that there are these big milled cutouts to remove even more material and weight. I suspect that the stock here is probably one of the bigger reasons that this rifle didn't go farther in testing. I suspect that while it was very effective at reducing weight, it probably would not have been durable enough for field use. Just handling this thing, looking at the small diameter of the wrist here, I have a feeling that troops in the field would have been breaking these stocks on a pretty regular basis. Um, one of the, the Lee Enfield strengths is that it is a really quite durable rifle. You can beat that thing up and it, it won't break on you, and I suspect this stock would have broken. As I mentioned, the, ori the rifles originally were fitted with recoil pads made by the Hawkins Company. This is one where all of the little air spaces in here have collapsed, and this thing is... this thing's pretty hard. Um, it is definitely not rubber... not soft rubber anymore, so that doesn't really matter for the original design of the rifle. You know, they didn't anticipate for these things to have a service life of 70 years, obviously, but... Uh, just indicative of the fact that they were expecting significant recoil if they actually fitted a recoil pad to a stock military rifle. Um, and at about six and a half pounds, yeah, this thing would have would have kicked fairly substantially. So there are only two basic markings on this rifle. We have one right here on the top of the receiver that says J5550 and then 13. 13 is the serial number, and the J5550 is actually the drawing number for the receiver of this rifle. So that was basically an identification of what the gun was. And then we have that same mark repeated on the bolt handle. So exact same thing. There are 13s on a couple of the other serialized parts. But that's it for uh, markings. Normally you would expect something on the socket uh, metal, but of course this is a one-piece stock and doesn't have a socket. Well, the number 5, of course, didn't turn out to be a particularly successful rifle, as it was only made for about two years before it was scrapped, with problems from wandering zero, which is a debated phenomenon still to this day. There are a lot of people who would suggest that the wandering zero... Uh, you know, the, the fact that they wouldn't hold a precise point of aim, or point of impact, was actually political cover to get rid of the rifles for other reasons. The data at least seems to be reasonably um, sure that they were, in fact, problematic for point-of-impact, point-of-aim issues. But uh, it's certainly interesting to look at the other guns that took part in this same trial. Whether the Canadian version of the Lightning No. 4 would have performed better? Who's to say? The Lightning cuts on the receiver are different, might not have contributed to the same problem. Certainly in American and British testing, accuracy didn't seem to be a big issue. Um, I should say, actually, accuracy was a big issue, but it was an issue because 
one of the test rifles, they managed to gouge the, the crown and not notice it. Anyway, if you'd like to own this one, you can, because it is coming up for sale here at James Julia. There are only a handful of these around, and it's a really cool example of a what might have been sort of alternative lightened rifle design. Now take a look at the description text below, you'll find a link there to the catalog page for this rifle. You can take a look at Julia's pictures and provenance and description, and place a bid right there through their website. Thanks for watching.